go on his show, Hans Breitling was this journalist who really believed in Gera and was very convinced and could not really accept the idea that Randy could replicate, right? And incidentally, this was the day of black and white television. You older folks may remember that. <laughs> long time ago. It's only black and white television. So, so he invited you, uh, but you suspected, uh, um, let's say, it was not going to be that clear. And so you said, I'm not going to perform because I know that conditions would be very different from those that you gave to your regular, so uh, probably I wouldn't be able to do anything. Oh, don't worry, he said, right? Okay. You just come uh, and we talk, we just talk. Yes. And this is what happens to the scale. Suddenly, this presenter takes out two spoons. Si è spinto anche più in ha voluto dimostrare che anche persone competenti in trucchi possono essere vittime di inganni e l'ha dimostrato nel corso di un programma televisivo in Canada. Questo signore è Alan Spider, parapsicologo convinto, autore di libri e anche esperto in trucchi. E gli aveva invitato James Randi alla sua trasmissione proprio per dimostrare che lei in realtà non era capace di fare le cose che un regalo faceva. Questa rasse due cucchiai che aveva portato lui stesso da casa, due cucchiai antichi da collezione, e chiese a Randy di piegarli strofinandoli semplicemente alla maniera di vendere. Doveva essere questa la dimostrazione che Randy non avrebbe mai potuto fare una cosa del genere in quelle condizioni. Ecco invece cosa accade. It was 
raining heavily outside, and I told the guard at the door, uh, I, I'm going to go and get something to eat. I'm a little hungry. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll just go back and uh, leave a note for Mr. Sprague. Now, Mr. Sprague was with Walter B. Gibson at that time, if you know that name at all. And he was in the studio, and I saw that he was recording. So I very carefully went around outside the studio, tried the door, said, Alan Sprague on the door. I opened the door, went inside, saw a briefcase, opened it up, very carefully opened an envelope on the inside, saw what it was. I see. Closed it. <laughs> Sterling silver spoon, really beautiful. Right? And I put it back in the suitcase and closed. And I walked outside and I said to the guard, Mr. Schweiger is in the studio and very busy. But uh, if, if he asks, tell him I'll be back in a little while. I'm going to have something to eat. Oh, okay. The guard left and he went outside because they were changing the guard. Talk about fortune. I mean, really. They were changing the guard, so the next guard who came in had never met me. He didn't know that I had already been into the studio, and uh, so that was, I would walk in and I said, my name is James Randy, and I'm supposed to see Mr., what is it, Sprague? <laughs> and uh, he said, oh yes, Mr. Sprague, we'll be with you in a few minutes. And he rang the buzzer, and pretty soon down the hall, Spraggett, not knowing that I'd already been in his office and did all these terrible things. And I met him and I said, are you Mr. Spraggett? How do you do this? Here? And uh, that's the way the murder took place. And while I sat there and Spraggett was astonished over what I had done, I looked at the control room and I saw several of my friends, including Walter B. Gibson, a very well known writer in the United States. <coughs> and so Houdini's uh, uh, Houdini's biographer, yes, as a matter of fact. And Sprague, Sprague was just <laughs> going crazy. And Walter B. Gibson sat there and he looked at me and he went. <laughs> so that was a great picture. But you were able to do it because you were, you know, you were using what magicians usually use, which is to be one step ahead of the audience. Yeah, right. you, you were already ready before everything started. And that's because you were a magician. So maybe we could open this window a little and talk a little bit about your magic career. Uh, you were like a dealer at the dimension, an escape artist. Well, I broke out of the quite a number of jails in my day and had a tremendous collection of handcuffs and all kinds of feathers and strange things like that. Studied them very carefully and I learned to pick regular locks on doors uh, that very early in my life, very, very early as a child and uh, it was not looked upon as something that I shouldn't be doing but uh, I did it because I had admired the life of Harry Houdini, of course, though he was dead before I was born. And therefore I never got a chance to meet him. No, it's actually impossible to meet people if they're already dead. <laughs> I'm not really sure you of that. <laughs> and uh, so I, I started by going around to the local jails. Now I was born in Toronto, Canada. And, uh, I started going around to the local jails and studying their locks. And uh, what's up there? Oh, yes. And there I am at the grave of Houdini in the Macaulay Cemetery uh, in New York State. And uh, I wore the hat because I have respect for people like this. And this is something that's a bust of Houdini on the top. And that's his original name, Weiss, there. And uh, that's the seal of the Society of American Magicians on the stone. That bust was subsequently stolen and taken away, but there was a replica of it in a museum in uh, New York, and they replicated it again and put it back on top of the 
pedestal. But these things have happened and will continue to happen, I'm afraid. And I think there's a replica also near you. Yes, yes. <laughs> hey, as a matter of fact, you know the name Penn and Teller? Mm -hmm. Okay, very, very great enthusiasm here from this young man. Uh, Penn and Teller are two people that I introduced many years uh, before. They had come to hear a lecture by me, and one of them sat on this side of the audience, the other sat on this side, and uh, they knew one another because they were working in the streets. Penn was doing the older and bigger guy was doing juggling, wonderful club juggling, and Teller was doing a pantomime act uh, dressed as a Harlequin. And they were they knew one another just to say, hello, oh, good morning when they worked on the streets of Philadelphia. And uh, so they came to see my little lecture. And uh, I took the two of them afterwards, and I took them to a, the coffee shop. And I sat there, and I looked back and forth from one to the other. And Penn said to me, he said, you're looking at us like we're some sort of specimens. And I said, well, I'm thinking of Laurel and Hardy and uh, uh, Adam Sutell, yeah, all, all, all the comedy teams of, uh, uh, of fame in those days. And I thought, you two are perfectly nice. You're different sizes. One speaks, the other is mute. Uh, you're, you're a natural combination. And they sort of said, yes, well, we talked about it one time. Well, six or eight weeks later, I heard from Ben and he said, we're opening in a theater in Hollywood, on Hollywood Boulevard. And I knew that my encouragement of them had worked. And today they're known as Penn and Teller. They're world famous. They travel around the globe. And uh, they've done very well for themselves. And they always remember me. I get letters. I get email all the time and phone calls from them saying what they're doing currently. So this is one of the better things I've done in my life to introduce these two strange characters. As Teller once said to me, he's a small one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got it. All right. I mean, he doesn't speak, you see. He's a huge. Okay, thank you. A lot of people didn't get it. But uh, I forgive them. So you, you have performed most of your life as a, as a magician, as an escape artist, oh, but yes. you gave up escapes a long time ago. Yes, that's true. And you, you don't perform them any longer. Well, I should give a demonstration, don't you think? You, you think so? I need two gentlemen from the audience who will come up from here and uh, participate with me. Uh, if I can get down off here without falling and breaking my neck. Oh yeah, I can stay here, yeah. You can all see. Oh, be well the end there. You stand up. Okay, what do you do, sir? What is your name? I knew that. Would you stand up? And one more gentleman, please. Some of the other. You can never do that to hold up your hand. You're not a gentleman. Not a gentleman, but a fine lady. Yes. How do you do, sir? Very good. Uh, stand on one side of me here, one of you. That's very good. Okay. And, oh, I forgot to ask you. I'm sorry. Do you have a piece of coal about that long? You didn't want to be coal about that? Um, oh, by a strength of something. I would. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is a good and strong piece of coal. Would you hold on to that in both hands? Both hands are good. Same thing, both hands. Hold on to it. I want you to pull on it and make sure that it doesn't stretch. Very good, thank you. Are you exhausted? I can see that. Right. I'm going to take off this uh, cheap wristwatch here and put it away so that I don't damage it. Thank you very much on that. I know your name, so. All right, now I'm going to ask these gentlemen to tie my hands together behind my back. And when I say that, I want you to really pull very tightly on it. Okay, here. Hold on to that end. That's your end again. Right there. That's it. And this is your end. Would you hold on to that? Hold on, both hands. Come on, both hands. There, pull on now. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I just have to bring it up on top. Hold tight there. You're not pulling tightly enough. That's it. Tie them on top. Yes, thank 
Okay? That's what I want. Don't break the cufflinks. Right? Pull them out. Come on. That's it. Good and tight. Put another knot on top of it. Yes, please. Your God has nothing to do with it. <laughs> there you go. All right? Good evening now. That's it. Is there room for another knot? Yeah. Okay, well. Go ahead. All right. Now that's tight. All right, thank you. I'm going to let go now. Thank you. Now, I'm going to try to free myself from this very simple tire. Don't stand quite too tight. <laughs> Sorry, 
I want to this exact illusion, done that way with that kind of timing and everything. Uh, and I show one of the very first uh, stage and television shows that David Copperfield ever appeared on. And uh, I had met him just previously. And there was another magician named Shimada, very famous in the United States, a Japanese friend of mine. And uh, when I get out of the can, I sit up on top of it. They don't see that, of course, you see. And uh, I, I drain off a little bit so that I'm more presentable when I walk through the curtain. And while I'm sitting there, now there's no top in the curtain. I hear a voice. It was a David Copperfield who turned to Mr. Shimada and said, you know, Shimada, that doesn't look too difficult to me. And they were standing directly above me, <laughs> about three feet, a meter or so away. I looked up at them. I wondered how they had gotten there. And uh, Shimada said, no, I think I'm going to get one of those cans. <laughs> Maybe I'll do the same trick. Well, let's go. And Copperfield and Shimada walked off, and I just shook my face like that. And then I walked through the curtain, of course, for my finale. But the audience never knew about that. Many years later, I was in, um, I think it was CBS uh, television studio in Los Angeles. And one of the, I was rehearsing on one stage, and a, a prop man came to see me, and he said, oh, do you know Shimada? I said, yes, I do. He said, he's in the next studio. He's setting up his props. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So I walked in very quietly, and I heard, well, I find anything, God damn it, there was any complaints. And I looked over and saw the lights on here, and I saw Shimada laying on his back, trying to adjust a gigantic dragon that he had built especially for this show. And he was cursing and went, God damn it, we need to carry on. So I just walked over, and his feet were sitting out here. And I said, you know, that doesn't look too difficult. I think I'll take one of these. And I heard roaring with laughter underneath and he finally came out. So that was my revenge. I haven't had any revenge on him yet, but maybe next year or the year after, we'll see. <laughs> I thought you would like me sharing that story with you. So do you miss not doing those kind of escapes any longer? Yes, I do, but at the age of um, 89, you know, I think uh, it, it would not be uh, quite as effective if I were to try it again. Now, maybe I'll take a wet sponge. Do an escape from that. There's another side to your magic which you just get a little glimpse of, but we, if you don't want, we cannot talk about it. Let's see. This is new design box fabric softener. It works in your dryer, where it does some amazing things. It makes your clothes wonderfully soft. It eliminates static clean completely. Makes your clothes smell fresh and beautiful. A fresh smell that lasts days longer than liquids. And it couldn't be easier. Watch. Now Bounce has a new embossed design. As the ingredients are released, the design disappears and Bounce softens, eliminates static cling, and gives clothes a long lasting freshness. See? Design's gone. How do they do that? For long lasting freshness, use new design Bounce, the right fabrics on there. We'd like you to see for yourself how amazing Bounce really is. Just send in a label from your liquid softener, and we'll send you four sheets of new design Bounce, free. You'll see it's the right fabric softener. Wow. So I do have a commercial life, as you see. <laughs> so, next? All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we'll go back to talking about um, psychics and frauds. Okay. We are almost over and maybe there is time for a few questions, but also we have a panel, so maybe you can also ask Brian a few questions later. Um, this is very fun to watch, of course, because this is entertainment. But there are people who are using the same 
techniques of magicians right. in a not so uh, fun way. And I'm thinking of uh, many, many examples uh, from Peter Pop or from uh, which are dealing with uh, people's uh, needs. Yes. Get better to hear emotional needs. Yes, exactly. Yes. 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 Uh, what is the worst that you found in this field? The worst at all? Yeah. Well, Peter Popoff was one of them. And uh, I exposed him on a show that was in the United States known as the Johnny Carson Show. Johnny left us a few years ago, unfortunately. And uh, I used to do that program. I did 33, I think, one of the other appearances on that show over the years. And uh, John was, was very generous with me. He would always come to my dressing room before the show was being taped. And he would come inside and he would, he would ask me and say, what do you need me to mention as something that you, you would like to have mentioned? And I would uh, perhaps think of something that he could mention to, to give me a, a, a beginning on a subject. And uh, but John smoked. Oh, oh. Uh, John smoked all the way through the show. It wasn't seen because in those days it was against the law for a person running a television show like that to actually smoke on camera. Uh, they formed a law against it and it was very serious and very, very tight, that law. But John would smoke, he had a secret device beneath the table and it had a little muffin fan on it and was smoking a cigarette for him, it was an automatic machine. And he would look, you would see him looking in the, the camera like this, and I would be on the other side of the camera, and back to him, and he would be looking around, trying to see when I was on camera, but his face was not. The minute that they gave him the signal that he could go for the smoke, he would lean down, take the cigarette, <laughs> puff on it, and look right back. <laughs> just a moment ago, he got to be very good at that. But smoking killed Johnny Carson eventually. Mm -hmm. It killed him, lung cancer. It, 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 was, it was not a pleasant death, obviously. I, I lost one of my very good friends to smoking. Smoking is about the most stupid thing that you can do. And there are a lot of as well. And so I'm, I'm very sensitive to that subject. It is a totally stupid thing, but in the United States it's so like any other merchandise, oh yes, commercial announcements, yes, this is the finest tobacco you can buy. Yes, that's a fine way to die. I, I, I hate the tobacco industry, and I think that if President Trump would ever get around to do anything useful, perhaps he might want to do something in that direction. I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> Here's an example of how uh, people prey on, uh, on, uh, yes. on each other. It means take advantage. And you, on the Johnny Carson show, you showed how this was done. And we can uh, maybe see the video that you have. Yes.
to take place by actually penetrating the body. Believe me, what you're seeing is strictly special effects, a sleight of hand, and nothing more. And this is the way it looks.
call to talk to a group like this of skeptical people. Very proud and rather humbled by the fact that she would come and sit in a theater like this for this long period of time to hear what I have to say. The work you do is important as skeptics. It's important. Please continue it. Because each and every one of you has the potential of saving someone from making a wrong decision somewhere along the line. Those wrong decisions could cost people's lives. I urge you all, work hard on it. Make your feelings known. Write articles on it in your own language and make sure that they get circulated. Appear on television at every opportunity if you think you have something valuable to say that will be effective and will affect people's way of thinking. The work that you can do in this regard is extremely important, ladies and gentlemen. And there may be people sitting right here before me. I suspect there are people sitting here who can do the same kind of thing or just a mere appearance <coughs> and a lecture to people who may fall for these charlatans. They're criminals, in my estimation. I know they're fakes. And I think we all know that they are fakes. Miracles like this, like what you saw me demonstrating, they don't happen. They're fake. And I had the great opportunity during my lifetime to appear many, many times on television in this country and all over the world. That was a great privilege. And I thank you for granting me that privilege and for being my audience today. Thank you, each and every one.